Okay, thank you and welcome back. This is part two of our two hour course um, regarding self administration of medication. So we're learning about how to properly assist residents with medications. And we last left off on part one, um, we covered the nine rights of medication administration. So now we're moving along <clears throat> into our section here on best practice and how to uh, avoid medication errors because as we all know, medication errors are not only fatal or can be fatal to the patient. Unfortunately, they are very prevalent within healthcare. So any time or any measures we can take to reduce the prevalence of medication errors, we want to do so because the ultimate goal is to keep the patient safe. So what are some of the common errors that we are looking out for um, or that seem to occur? <clears throat> so as you can see here in red, some of the most common types of errors, the wrong time, the omission of a dose. Remember, we're documenting uh, when we give medication, so it's being noted that doses are being missed, okay? Uh, or the wrong dose, or sometimes we're given an extra dose. Um, and then some of the common medications, which now all medications have some type of effect on the patients, of course, but we know some are more prone to uh, error. And those medications, unfortunately, that are more prone to error also carry a more heavy repercussion if we do not administer those medications properly. And those are here in red. There will be insulin for patients with diabetes, and that's any type of insulin. Warfarin or Coumadin, that's a blood thinner. Uh, Lasix, that's to help uh, pull fluid out of a patient, also has effects on blood pressure. And also you see different types of pain medication and anti-anxiety medications, Ativan here. Um, now, anytime you are unsure about a medication or any element of the nine rights of administration, if you're an unlicensed or even if you are licensed, you need to ask another nurse or ask the medical professional who is licensed to help you, assist you to make sure that we avoid medication errors at all costs. And here's just some added information for you so you can see the percentage of one particular study um, that tracked which type of errors occur and how often. So you see here wrong time at 71.3%. That seems to be the most common medication error at this specific facility where that study was conducted. Now, how do we prevent these errors? Um, again, always triple check the medication. So not only are we triple checking um, who we are administering the medication to, to make sure it's the right patient. Not only are we triple checking to make sure the medication is correct for the resident who we're giving the medication to, but we're triple checking the actual medication. Um, and once you get into a habit of checking and checking and checking these things, um, it becomes second nature and it doesn't seem so much of a task as it's just the way you learn to do things. So some medication do's and don'ts. Um, do assist the resident in taking each medication as it's prescribed. Make sure that the resident's doctors and healthcare practitioners know all about your resident's medications. Um, do use the triple check system. Make sure all orders are written and signed. That is very important um, because sometimes doctors input medications and we wanna make sure that the doctor signed off on that medication and the order isn't just pending. Okay, maybe the doctor got called away and they didn't get to sign off on that medication and they weren't quite ready to administer it. And um, we may make the mistake of thinking that that order was actually signed off. And even though you know who the resident is and you've seen them all day, always identify who the resident is with your two patient identifiers, their name, first and last, and date of birth. Medication don'ts. So don't use contaminated medications that have been dropped on the floor. Don't use abbreviations. When we're discussing or sharing uh, information about the medications, write the entire name out. Um, don't crush or break pills unless the resident's doctor instructs you to do so. So if the patient is taking the medication and they say, oh, you know, I'm not the best at swallowing pills. Can you break this in half? 
It may seem like something simple and easy to do in the moment to facilitate the request of the patient, but you don't know if that medication can be crushed, should be crushed, or how crushing that medication will change the effects once administered to the patient. So that's a key right there that I want to make sure I touched on. Do not break the pill unless the doctor instructs you to do so. Well, you're probably asking, well, what do I do if the patient can't take the pill because it's too big? You need to let the doctor know, okay? Let the doctor know so the doctor can order an alternative medication. Maybe that's available in a liquid form. Maybe it's available in a smaller pill. Um, but we need to talk to the doctor first to make sure. Um, how to prevent wrong resident errors. Okay, how do we do this? You want to always reduce the errors. We're there to help the patients, not hurt the patients. So just the basics that we have been going over, checking the ID bracelet, using our two patient identifiers, not using the room or bed number, okay? And always, um, always, 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 two patient identifiers will triple checking everything to make sure Okay, now how do we prevent wrong drug errors? Again, we're triple checking everything. Um, so it's suggesting here is print the generic name using tall man lettering, such as clonidine, okay? Because sometimes medication names sound alike, look alike. So you wanna make sure you're paying extra attention to those medications if the patient has those on their medication profile, okay? Um, how to prevent wrong time errors. Remember, um, the study that I showed you on the previous page, wrong time occurs, uh, accounted for 71.3% of the medication errors at the facility where that study was conducted. So remember, the acceptable time is one hour before or one hour after, but we always want to strive to give the medication as close to the desired time, okay? How to prevent overdosing. Overdosing, how do we do that? It sounds easy, you just don't give the patient too much medication. But we wanna take steps to make sure we reduce errors, okay? Sometimes we get pulled in different ways, we get distracted, or maybe the patient is forgetful if they took a dose or not. So we want to make sure we're documenting, we want to have systems in place to make sure that every time we administer a medication, it's recorded and an additional dose is not given inadvertently. And also, please take note to the high alert medications. Remember, we talked about every medication has some type of effect on the patient, but specifically there are medications which are more commonly error prone, and those errors unfortunately carry a significant weight um, if they're administered incorrectly, um, causing the uh, detriment to the patient's health. And those medications include anticoagulants, so anything that's gonna thin the patient's blood, or antiplatelets, or insulin, anti-diabetic medications, and of course, anything to do with pain medication, okay? These medications, we wanna make sure high alert, high alert, if we're dealing with blood pressure medications, we're dealing with anticoagulants, or any type of insulin or diabetic medication, high alert. Now, what are some safety practices that you can get into at your job to make sure that not only are you practicing safe, but you are assisting your patient to self-administer medication safely if you are an unlicensed professional. Always follow the nine rights. If you follow the nine rights of medication administration, you cannot go wrong. Um, but if you want to be on the right side of safe, additionally, always triple check yourself. Just get into the habit, triple checking yourself making sure that the medication matches the medication that is ordered and the order ma matches the medication that is in your hand, okay? Identify the resident with two forms of ID. This will make sure you never give the wrong medication to the wrong patient. Make sure you read the labels, follow the directions on the label as they are written. Make sure all orders are signed before you administer them and document, 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 okay? Sound alike, look alike drugs, we talked about that. Making sure that if a medication looks alike, we can always um, make sure safe practices are in place, such as tall lettering, 
um, to differentiate between medications that may look alike. Now we're moving along to chapter three, self-administered self medication use and storage. So residents who are capable of self-administration without assistance should be encouraged to do so. We want them to maintain some type of autonomy, some type of independence, and I'm sure they do as well, okay? And having them help you can also help reduce the risk because not only am I checking to make sure that the medication I'm giving them or assisting them to take is correct, they have been, uh, they have some type of independence in administering it to themselves because, we, because we've been encouraging them to do so. So it decreases the chances of a medication error, okay? Now, how do we make sure uh, the resident is self-administering medications appropriately, okay? Um, we first, we can assess their ability to store and self-administer self medications. Sorry, I keep messing up that phrase. Um, and how do we do this? We assess their capacity, we talk to them, we give them the medication, and we just watch to make sure that they are able to follow instructions correctly and that they are uh, administering the medication according to protocol um, as indicated by the doctor or on the medication bottle or packaging. Um, we should monitor for side effects or adverse consequences when they take the medications because maybe this particular medication they're taking has a unwanted side effect that maybe they shouldn't administer to themselves. Maybe a nurse or a licensed professional should be present when that medication is being given, okay? Such as if it makes them feel dizzy or lightheaded. Maybe that isn't a medication they should give to themselves. They should give it, to, they sh it should be given to them by a licensed professional so that they can be monitored because we don't want them to get up and fall, okay? And of course, as we talked about in part one, under no circumstances can we compel a resident to take a medication. They have that right. If they don't wanna take that medication, even if it is detrimental to their own health, we cannot force them to take it, okay? We cannot hide the medication in applesauce or yogurt or things like that. We cannot do that. Um, so in green here, you'll see any locked medication should be stored, of course, in an area where it's not damp or there is a significant temperature change, except for medications that require refrigeration. Okay, so make sure the medications are being stored in a dry, cool area. Now, you're probably saying, oh, well, um, the patient's, patient likes the room cold or the patient's uh, chest is next to the window. Is that appropriate? Is that appropriate? Okay, well, let's talk about that. So storage in a resident's room in order to accommodate the needs and preferences of residents and we want to encourage them to remain as independent as they can. And uh, by doing that, we want to uh, make sure that they're doing things right as well. We want to make sure that any medications which are put in their possession are being stored appropriately. And the medications must be kept locked when the residents aren't in the room unless it's in a secure place inside the room, such as a safe or just out of sight of other residents because as we know, some residents have Alzheimer's. They may forget which room is theirs, wander into another patient's room, stumble upon their medications, and take medications which aren't theirs, okay? So we want to prevent that. So we want to guide and recommend safe places of storage for the patient who is self-administering their medications to put their medications someplace that's out of sight, that is not prone to significant temperature changes and is not a place um, that is wet, okay? Um, let's see. Oh, and of course, a place that is locked when the resident is not there. So there must be some type of lock uh, mechanism, okay? Now, some residents, uh, they may be able to, they may be able to self-administer their medications but they may need some assistance in storing the medications or perhaps it's a medication which we don't allow them to store in their room. Um, so what do we do for this situation? Well, of course there is a central storage in every facility, some type of pharmacy or locked area where we can keep the patient's medications. 
uh, make sure that we keep a list of all medications being stored upon the patient's request or upon the doctor's request. We keep a list. Uh, and I would say a list of that should be placed in the patient's room and also, of course, kept on file with the patient's chart or in the medication room where the medication is stored. Okay, but make sure you're checking up with your specific facilities policies um, provided for residents storing their own medications, because when residents have their own medications, um, they must be kept locked or else it's considered a safety hazard, okay? So we don't want to get in trouble or to keep, and we want to keep our patients out of trouble um, and safe. So we wanna make sure that we are following the protocols within our specific facility. Now, centrally stored medications, so this is medications which are not kept in the residence room, must be locked in either a cabinet or cart or some type of room at all times. And of course, we talked about uh, it must be free from dampness unless it needs to be refrigerated and it must be kept in a normal temperature um, separately from other medications from other residents. And it must be properly closed and sealed and labeled, okay? Centrally stored medications must be locked in a box, cabinet, cart. Yes, we have that in bright red. That is very important information. Now, what if the medication that was ordered for the patient is discontinued? What if the patient was taking a medication, uh, antibiotic for a uh, ear infection and the ear infection healed? So the doctor discontinued the medication. What do we do then? Discontinued medications must be stored separately from current medications in use and they must be marked discontinued medication. Please, please do not forget to mark discontinued medication, okay? And if the medication is in a patient's room, please take it out of the patient's room and put it in uh, the central storage and mark discontinued medication so the patient isn't confused and explain to them why the medication was discontinued, okay? And of course, check the doctor's orders to make sure that the medication was discontinued at the correct time. Okay, now pill organizers. This is an essential component of medication administration within an assisted living facility. And of course, a task for nurses because nurses licensed under this specific statute may manage individual weekly pill organizers for residents who self-administer medications. And by nurses, that is licensed healthcare professionals. So unlicensed healthcare professionals cannot manage individual weekly pill organizers, okay? Now what constitutes a pill organizer? Well, you see here the standard Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday pill organizer, okay? And only a resident who self-administers medications can have a pill organizer. A nurse manages the pill organizers for the Medicaid, for the residents who are self-administering their medications and they are responsible for instructing the resident on proper use of the pills inside of the pill organizer, okay? The uh, pill organizers and containers need to be labeled, of course, and any medications from the original container, you know, the orange one that comes from the pharmacy um, must also be labeled and the nurse must manage that container as well uh, as far as transferring the pills from the original pill bottle into the medication, uh, into the pill organizer. You must have the resident's name according to the date and time increments as prescribed, must all be listed on the pill organizer and return the unused medication to the proper storage area for that resident, for that resident document the date and time that the pill organizer was filled in the resident's record, okay? If there is a determination that the resident is not taking medications as prescribed after the medicinal effects are explained, it shall be noted in the resident's record and the facility should consult with the resident concerning providing assistance with self-administration, okay? Because we're assuming that if the resident is 
has a pill organizer that they are able to self-administer. But if the resident is refusing medications, then maybe something changed. So we need to let the facility know this, okay? So if you are an unlicensed professional and you note that the resident is not properly at, uh, taking their medications from the pill organizer, or they are completely refusing medications, let the nurse know, document what medications were not taken, what time they, was re they were refused, <clears throat> because the facility needs to take action and maybe this patient is not appropriate to self-administer. Unlicensed personnel are forbidden from using pill organizers. Assistance with self-administration does not include pill organizers, okay? So if you are unlicensed, you cannot touch the pill organizer. You cannot manage it, only the registered nurse. Only a family member or friend may assist residents with pill organizers, except for pharmacists, physicians, and nurses. Unlicensed personnel are forbidden from using pill organizers. So if the patient has a pill organizer, it is best that you steer clear if you are unlicensed professional, okay? Now, chapter five, assistance with self-administration. This is one of the most important services that any assisted living facility provides to their residents, making sure that we pick the correct medications, making sure they're going to the right patient, making sure they're being taken as prescribed, um, making sure that we're documenting any reactions, the therapeutic effect of them. This is, this is the biggest task, um, in my opinion. And the second biggest task, of course, to me, is preventing falls and skin breakdown. But that is a different presentation for a different day. Today, we are focusing on self-administration, okay? Now, medication assistance with self-administration is considered or defined as helping a person with oral ingestion, topical application, and or oral or nasal inhalation of medications as prescribed by a doctor. The term competent resident which is admission criteria <clears throat> for a resident, means that the resident is able to understand what medication is required and the purpose for taking said medication. Residents must be capable, capable of taking their own medication with assistance from staff if necessary. And there is a resident assessment form it may be different for each facility, but if there's a specific form used to evaluate a resident's ability to safely self-administer medication. And we'll look at the sample here provided in Appendix 3, okay? If the individual is determined not to be competent or capable to self-administer, the facility must inform the resident of the professional qualifications of facility staff who will be providing the assistance and if unlicensed staff will be providing such assistance, obtain the resident's written and informed consent. So if the resident is determined to be unable to self-administer medications for whatever reason, before we administer, we, we, before we assist the resident with the administration of their medications, there needs to be uh, education provided to the patient of the professional qualifications of the staff who will be assisting the patient with taking the medications. And if it is an unlicensed assist staff, we also need to obtain the resident's written and form consent. So that means we just have to get consent that they say, yes, it's okay for the LVN, Grace, and the unlicensed professional, Brian, to administer medications to me. Um, informed consent means advising the resident whether a licensed nurse will or will not supervise assisted living staff. Assisted living facilities are not required to have a licensed nurse on staff. So we need to educate the patient about this. We need to make sure they feel comfortable and we need to make them feel comfortable because we are qualified whether you have a license or not. That is if you have received the appropriate training, okay? So make them feel comfortable, speak to your experience, Tell them, about, tell them about your uh, capabilities um, and assist them appropriately. The facility, well, assisted living facilities do accept residents who require assistance with that medication administration. 
And if the facility has a nurse to provide this service or the resident contracts with the licensed third party to provide this service, okay? Unlicensed staff in order to assist with self-administration of medications, they must successfully complete a six hour training program provided by a licensed staff. That can be a registered nurse, a pharmacist, or a department of elder affairs staff. Now, this definition should have probably been reviewed a little bit earlier, but we have it here now. What is an unlicensed person? In case it wasn't clear to you, an unlicensed person is an individual who is not currently licensed to practice nursing or medicine, who is employed by or under contract to an assisted living facility. That person who is unlicensed also has received training with self-administration of medications in an assisted living facility prior to providing such assistance, okay? Courses provided in fulfillment of this requirement must meet the criteria listed below, as you can see here, right next to this nice instructor. So <clears throat> it must cover state law and rule requirements regarding the following supervision, assistance, administration, safe management. So all of this information must be uh, covered under the training provided to the unlicensed professional in order for them to meet the criteria to, uh, to not work at the facility, but to practice self-administration as an unlicensed professional. There's a specific training that you must undergo. Each year, that unlicensed staff works at an assisted living facility, they must complete a two hour annual update training program. And this update program may be provided online. And it just so happens that I am teaching this training program, this exact training program, which is brought to you by my ALF, assistedlivingfacility.com, my ALF training.com, okay? Um, so, only a registered nurse, a licensed pharmacist, or Department of Elder Affairs staff person may provide this training. I am a registered nurse, and I am also a family nurse practitioner. A certificate of completion for assistance with self-administration of medication training must be documented, and you must have a copy of the original in your personal file at the facility where you work. Unlicensed professionals may, consistent with the dispensed prescriptions label or the package directions of an over-the-counter medication, assist a resident whose condition is medically stable with the self-administration of routine, regularly scheduled medication. So you can assist residents with the medications, okay? But you must, um, in order to facilitate this assistance, of course, you must prepare items like water, juice, spoons, tongue blades, things of that nature, all used to help our residents swallow or take their medications. Self-administered medications include prescription and over-the-counter medication. So, if it, so even if it isn't a prescribed drug, it just could be a supplement or a vitamin that is also considered a medication and it need, you need to be um, completing the training annually, this two hour training course, um, and if you have not, because this is your first time working at this facility as an uh, unlicensed professional, then you need to complete the introductory six hour training course and it must be taught by a licensed professional. Okay. Assistance with self administration means verbally prompting a resident to take medication as prescribed, retrieving and opening a properly level labeled medication container and providing assistance. So any type of assistance, even telling the patient hey, it's time for you to take your medication, is considered assisting them with self-administration and you need to have the appropriate training to do so, okay? Now, in addition to the specifications we talked about, we talked about above, specifically here, the specific training uh, specifications. It also includes reading the medication label aloud. So not only does just verbally telling the patient it's time for you to take your medication, but reading the label aloud, if they simply can't see which medication is which and they need you to read the label, that is considered assistance with self-administration, okay? And you can read here from A to M 
what uh, <clears throat> different types of actions that are also considered assistance with self-administration. So reading the label, placing an oral dosage in the resident's hand, applying topical medications, returning the medication container to proper storage. So this taking out of taking it out of their hand and putting it back wherever they have it safely and securely stored, keeping a record of when the resident receives, using a glucometer to perform blood sugar checks. Even if you're not administering the insulin, you're just checking the blood sugar. You need to have the correct training, okay? Medications that appear to have contaminated, I'm sorry, appear to have been contaminated should not be returned to the container. If, for example, of course, if it was dropped on the floor, that of course goes without saying, okay? Um, staff should observe the resident take the medication. So when you are assisting a patient with taking a medication, you should observe them taking the medication, okay? You shouldn't just give them the medication and then walk out because you have something else to do. We need to stand there, make sure they take it. And then sometimes many patients uh, like to trick us. So we need to make sure not only did they uh, put the medication in their mouth, but we need to make sure that they didn't keep it in their mouth to uh, discard it after we leave. So you wanna make sure you check under their tongue on the side of their cheek and such, okay? Assistance with self-administration does not include, so we've talked about everything that self-administration does include, but it does not include mixing or calculating doses, preparing a syringe for injection, okay? So if the patient is a diabetic, we know diabetics need to take insulin. If the patient can't see the numbers on the insulin syringe and they ask you, what number is this? What number is that? Please do not tell them even if you can read the number because that is outside of the scope of your practice if you are an unlicensed, a unlicensed professional, okay? You need to make note of that. The patient needs that type of assistance and maybe that specific medication, the patient should not be able to self-administer, okay? Um, also, assistance with self-administration does not include uh, the breeding agents on the use of the skin. Um, medications ordered by the physician or healthcare professional with prescriptive authority should be given as needed unless the order is written with specific parameters. Okay. Unlicensed staff, again, were not allowed to fill syringes by any means, okay? Please note, please, please note, please note. When you are assisting a resident and you are unlicensed, assisting them with administering a PRN medication, which means a medication which should be taken as needed. Um, if you inappropriately delegate, if the, a licensed nurse inappropriately, which means they tell you as the unlicensed professional to take responsibility for assisting the patient with self-administering um, a PRN medication, the nurse could jeopardize their license because they should not be delegating that to you. If the medication is PRN, that means it requires some type of nursing judgment. And even though that judgment may seem very simple to you or very simple to the patient, do not participate. Uh, let, the let the licensed professional know, let the registered nurse know that you are not qualified to make that judgment call. So you cannot self-administer that medication to the patient. <clears throat> and either a nurse or trained unlicensed staff must be in the facility at all times when residents need assistance with any medications, okay? So do not leave the resident alone to self-administer. When resident is away from the facility, okay? So when the resident who receives assistance with their medication has for some reason left the facility for any reason, um, what do we do to make sure the, med uh, the resident is taking their medications as prescribed? Well, the healthcare provider may prescribe a medication schedule that coincides with the resident's presence in the facility. The medication container may be given to the resident or a friend or a family member to be taken with them. And we explain to them the regimen that the medication, the regimen that the patient is on and how and when to administer those medications. The medication may be transferred to a pill organizer. That would be the ideal situation here. 
But of course, the unlicensed professional cannot fill that pill organizer. That is a responsibility only the licensed professional can assume, okay? Medications may be separately prescribed and dispensed in an easier to use forms, such as unit dose packaging, as pictured here, okay? And for now, we're going to stop here. We will resume shortly with part three of our self-administration uh, assistance for assisted living facility residents.